Just under two months ago, to be precise on March 22nd, Amazon published a much noticed blog post and you can find the link in the video description below with the admittedly somewhat lengthy title Scaling up the Prime Video Audio Video Monitoring Service and Reducing Costs by 90%. And that alone is quite intriguing. After all, who wouldn't want to reduce their own cloud infrastructure costs by 90% while achieving better scalability at the same time? But it gets even better, because the subtitle of this blog post, that's where the real magic happens, since it says, the move from a distributed microservices architecture to a monolith application helped achieve higher scale, resilience and reduce costs. That's what I call grist to the mill for those who have long been saying that microservice architectures are totally overrated and that in many, many cases a monolith would just be perfectly sufficient. And that was the message that could be read on Twitter, on Hacker News and everywhere else. Paraphrasing, Amazon itself no longer believes in microservices. Microservices are a stupid idea or microservices are just dead. However, as is so often the case when you only read the headline, you might miss the actual core of the story. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's video. We're going to take a closer look at what is actually behind this blog post, what exactly Amazon did, and whether the title or the subtitle really say that microservices are in general a bad idea. With that in mind, hello and welcome to our very first weekly. Let's start with the question, what is the Amazon Prime Video Audio Video Monitoring Service? What a name and what it is good for. This question is relatively easy to explain or to answer. Prime Video is Amazon's video streaming service, basically their version of Netflix. And just like Netflix, of course, Amazon wants their users who consume Prime Video to have the best possible experience, as it's often nicely put. And that includes ensuring that the video stream is delivered properly and in a fine way. That there are no synchronization issues between audio and video, that no image fragments are distorted, that there are no glitches and so on. And that's exactly why every stream that is delivered goes through the audio video monitoring service. It essentially checks the stream in real time to see if everything is in order and if it detects a problem it takes care of notifying another process that should then fix the problem. So it's essentially the automated stream quality control or quality assurance and that's why it's no surprise that this service belongs to the VQA team which stands for Video Quality Analysis Team. And it's clear, if all streams that are delivered go through that service, then that service has quite a lot to do and accordingly the scalability of that service is a very, very important thing. And unsurprisingly, that service runs on AWS. It would indeed be quite strange if it weren't so. So how does this service actually work? In principle, it consists of three parts, or rather of three components. The media conversion service kicks things off. Its job is to disassemble the passing stream, breaking the video down into individual frames and the audio track into individual audio snippets. These are then examined by the second component, the defect detector, for any potential issues. As this happens independently for audio and video, someone has to synchronize the whole thing and that's the third component. That's just simply an AWS step function, which is a part of AWS Lambda, which you can think of as a quite long running workflow. And these three components have been implemented with different technologies or services. The media conversion service stored the frames and audio snippets it extracted in an S3 bucket. The step function responsible for synchronization then prompted the defect detectors to download these data from S3 for analysis and finally collected the results from there and reacted accordingly by notifying other, uh, other processes if necessary. 
And as I tell you this, you may notice that it might not be the most, in the truest sense of the word, cost-effective idea to first upload every single frame and audio snippet to S3, to just then download them again from S3. That sounds like quite an elaborate and especially expensive data exchange, as uploading and downloading data from S3 respectively to S3 costs real money, as these are so-called tier 1 requests. If you were only interested in the metadata, for example, that would be tier 2 and that would be much cheaper. However, in addition, the step function that synchronizes everything has to be activated dozens of times per second in principle for each frame and audio snippet individually. And how are step functions built? Exactly per activation. So if this function has to be activated dozens of times per second, that can quickly become quite expensive. And this becomes noticeable in the long run for a service, especially for a service like Prime Video with its high load. Now, one could ask why the VQA team built everything that way in the first place. After all, there are certainly no bad developers at AWS or at Amazon, and you would actually or somehow expect that these problems would have been foreseeable. And indeed, they were, as they openly admit. This was simply the first draft, the first iteration with which they started this service. At that time, it wasn't about creating the best possible implementation, coming up with a great architecture or something like that, but rather about getting a proof of concept out of the door, up and running as quickly as possible. And then, at Amazon, as everywhere else, if such a proof of concept is running and working, it often stays that way. And that's exactly what happened. Everything worked well, so why rebuild it right away? Why invest more effort right away? All of this can be done later, after all. As unfortunate as that may be, I find it quite reassuring and somehow quite adorable that things work the same way at Amazon as anywhere else. And sooner or later, there always comes the point in time where one has to tackle the whole thing, and that point had now arrived at Amazon, which is why they set the whole thing up again and rebuilt the entire service from scratch with an entirely new architecture. The new architecture, admittedly, is way simpler. Instead of having several services that communicate laboriously and expansively via S3 and have to be synchronized via a step function, the VQA team just went ahead and wrote one service that takes on all these tasks. So one service that is given a stream, extracts frames and audio snippets from it, analyzes them and does something based on the result. And all of this was built in such a way that this one service is now also just one process which is why all the data exchange regarding the frames and the audio snippets takes place entirely in memory, eliminating the need for S3, eliminating AWS Lambda, and we're simply talking about a process that can run permanently in a container on Kubernetes. And if the performance of this one container is not enough, then you simply start several containers. And because you now can avoid constantly shoveling gigabytes of data to S3 and from S3, and because all of this simply requires much less effort, it is not only faster, but especially cheaper. And that's, in the end, is the whole story. Of course, it's quite silly to say that Amazon no longer uses microservices. Amazon Prime Video, like everything else at Amazon, still uses an enormous number of small, cleanly separated business and technically isolated services, all of which work together to ensure that the services Amazon offers work properly. In that respect, Amazon continues to rely on a distributed microservice-based architecture just like before. So it's not at all the case that Prime Video would suddenly be a monolithic application, as some suggested. The only thing that has actually changed is that a very small component of Prime Video has been given a new internal structure and three formally distributed components are now united in one process. 
So if you look only at these three components, it is actually true that moving away from microservices to a monolith has led to more scalability and lower costs at the same time. But I think it's important not to lose sight of the bigger picture. It's like if Lego, in a set that consists of, let's say, 10,000 pieces, goes ahead and combines two bricks into a single new brick to optimize costs, so that instead of 10,000 pieces, we are now talking about 9,994 pieces in the future. If you only look at the two bricks that have been assembled together into a single brick, you could of course say, Lego is abandoning the modularity of its game system, but in relation to the overall model, that's of course completely nonsense. And that's what annoys me about Amazon blogs blog post. <laughs> and that's what annoys me about Amazon's blog post. They suggest with a subtitle, deliberately or unconsciously, that they would rely on monolith in the future. And all the developers out there, and also the tech editorial teams from magazines, online magazines, and so on, who have only read the teaser, who are now going around saying, We've always told you that microservices are overrated and monoliths are perfectly sufficient. Um, well, no, that's not the case. Of course, there are use cases where microservices are overkill. But monoliths, even though they are currently somehow hot, and it seems quite trendy in certain circles to badmouth microservices, none of this changes, changes the big picture and Amazon has done a disservice to the microservice community, in my opinion, because you are now confronted with the argument, but Amazon also thinks microservices are dumb. And you have to go and painstakingly straighten out what has actually happened, what Amazon actually meant, and what Amazon actually wrote about in their blog post on Prime Video. And I notice that I'm starting to get a little bit upset about all of this and I don't want that. So to cut a long story short, if you see such an article, then do not only read it completely, but especially read it carefully and question what is written in it. Don't just take the headline and run around spreading false facts or false rumors, because in the end it harms everyone. And in the worst case, it comes back to you as a boomerang because, after all, you, you were the one who may not have read or thought things through to the end. And if you've been dealing with microservices so far, then you don't need to worry that microservices would become extinct or go out of fashion. If you've been more involved with monoliths so far, the very same thing applies as well. And the only thing we can and we should actually learn from the entire story is that if you want to build software, it's good advice to do what the VQA team did, namely to question the chosen architecture from time to time, to critically evaluate it and to intervene in one direction or the other if in doubt. Microservices are not inherently wrong. Monoliths are not inherently right. The reverse is also true. What you need is the appropriate architecture for each individual use case. And now my question is, what is your take on all of this? Did you notice Amazon's blog post in the, in the first? Uh, and if so, did you actually read it or were you just surprised or maybe even pleased about the headline? And how do you feel about microservices and monolith? I would be very interested to know, so feel free to write your opinion, your thoughts, your ideas, maybe also your questions in the comments below. I would be very happy about that. Besides, if you liked the video today, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your colleagues, and last but not least, take good care of yourself, stay healthy, and then I wish you a good start into a hopefully beautiful and successful new week. In this sense, take care and see you next time. Bye.